from these humble and lighthearted beginnings, the faculty lecture series has grown to become this really important forum for tenured professors to share their latest research with the larger intellectual community of the college. So before we get started, um, I want to offer um, on my own behalf and on behalf of my faculty colleagues on the lecture committee who are Greg Mitchell and Siobhan Robinson, um, the warmest thanks to Carrie Green and to Veronica Bosley and to Patrick Gray, who um, uh, it's not an exaggeration to say, I don't think these events could happen without them, or probably many other events at the college. So thank you so much for your, for your support. We so appreciate it. And we are really thrilled that Matt Carter who is an associate professor of biology is here to, pre to present the first of um, the six talks in this year's series. Oh, and we've got the uh, question and answer box, the Q&A box open on the webinar. So please feel free to type in a question um, either during or after the lecture, it'd be fine. So Matt received his BA in biology from Whitman College in 2000 and then his PhD in neuroscience from Stanford University in 2010. And his research interests are in neuroscience. For instance, to ensure that an animal obtains an optimal amount of sleep, food, and water, the brain must sense the internal and external environment and influence behavior by producing sensations that we describe as tired or awake, hungry and full, thirsty or quenched. The ultimate goal of Matt's lab is to elucidate the neural basis of these homeostatic systems. Which, which neural populations and neural networks in the brain play an important role in maintaining homeostasis? And how does their activity affect animal physiology and behavior? Matt is currently a part of the Neuroscience Committee and uh, we will let him take it away with his paper today entitled The Food Network how your brain feels hungry and full. And Matt, thank you. We're so um, thankful to you for kicking off um, this year's series. So take it away. All right. Um, well, well, thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, I wanna thank you and the rest of the factual, uh, faculty lecture committee for uh, inviting me to be part of the faculty lecture series this year. And I also wanna thank Carrie Green and Veronica Bosley and Patrick Gray for um, all the help getting getting this going. Um, and of course, thanks to all of you for, for being here. I, I wouldn't describe the weather outside as, as great in Williamstown right now. It's a balmy uh, 38 degrees, but um, uh, it's definitely warmer than it's been. So thank you for uh, coming to yet another Zoom uh, presentation uh, today. I've actually uh, really always loved the faculty lecture series. I should say that at the beginning too. Um, it, it's fun to hear the origins of this series and to hear that it was designed to uh, entertain faculty spouses. And uh, I'm always up for that. But um, I've also enjoyed this uh, faculty lecture series myself. Um, I, I'm amazed by the, difference, uh, the differences in scholarship and creativity among uh, the faculty across campus. And it's been a joy every year to hear uh, not just how faculty discover new things and produce new knowledge, but the way in which we do it and uh, the mechanisms by which we learn uh, new things. And so um, this faculty lecture series, um, I know after I go, um, we're gonna hear from an artist, a poet, a psychologist, an economist, and uh, finally a computer scientist. And, um, and I can't wait to hear their talks as, as well. Um, so I am a neuroscientist and um, I have been uh, fascinated uh, by the brain for as long as I can remember. Um, so I think there's something um, about the brain that fascinates everybody. Um, it's, it's such a unique organ. And um, while I do love uh, physiology, and I, I love uh, learning about how all, all the organs work, the, the pancreas and the heart and the lung are, are different than the brain. The brain produces everything about uh, being a human and being alive in terms of our mental state and our mind and our personality. And so I've, I just think I've always found the brain very fascinating. But what I particularly find fascinating about the brain is how millions of years of evolution have hardwired the brain to guide us towards certain behaviors um, that are optimal for survival. Um, and I just get a kick out of knowing that the brain might be hardwired to do things in a way that we ourselves don't understand. And so I, uh, Matt Carter, uh, think I'm in charge of all of my behaviors 
behaviors and all of my decision making uh, without knowing that millions of years of evolution have hardwired my brain to make uh, decisions for me. And I, I think that one of the ways in which this is most apparent is survival related behaviors. And so in order to survive, as Stephanie uh, just said, we need an optimal amount of uh, nutrition, an optimal amount of water, sleep, and we need to be in a set temperature range. And the only way that an animal can do this is by changing its behavior. Um, so the brain meticulously measures these factors and um, shapes our behavior. And we call these behavioral states uh, being hungry or full, um, thirsty, quenched, sly, tired, sleepy, um, or too hot or too cold. And um, I, I think that the more I've learned about the brain, the more I realize just how exquisite the brain is hardwired to produce these, these behaviors. So for example, everyone listening right now, the average person listening needs 730,000 calories over the course of a year. But we don't need to keep track of that. We don't need Excel spreadsheets. Um, and the reason is because we didn't evolve with Excel spreadsheets. We evolved with a brain. And the brain meticulously measures the amount of calories we're getting and then tries to shape our behavior in ways that we don't completely understand in order to get that behavior. And I thought I'd start actually with one of my uh, favorite quotations that I think explains the biology that I do, which was from um, a 19th century philosopher, um, Arthur Schopenhauer, who uh, wrote, man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills. And if we want, we can get rid of the masculine pronouns here. So I can change this to a person can do what they will, but they cannot will what they will. And how I interpret this is I can choose to act on my hunger, but I can't choose to be hungry. That's this is something that my brain does for me. And I can try to distract myself, but the more I do that, the more the brain is going to um, enhance the discomfort of being hungry to try to guide me to do uh, what it is that I'm going to do. Um, and so um, what I'd like to do today is talk about the neurobiology of hunger and, and exactly what the brain is doing. And um, an example to just point out, I think how, how strong this is. Uh, some of you uh, listening, I'm sure have heard me use this example before, but when I came to Williams College, I drove from Seattle with my father in a moving truck. And one day we um, had a very, very light lunch. We, we didn't eat all that much. And so by dinner time, we were very, very hungry. And we stopped off at a restaurant and there was something on the menu called the Hungry Man Dinner. And when the food arrived, I took a picture of it. This is the Hungry Man Dinner. I won't tell you uh, which restaurant it was. But um, what I find fascinating looking at this picture now is not just that I ate it, um, but also that there was, a, at that moment in time, my brain was motivating me to be very, very hungry to, to, to eat this, this meal. And then 20 minutes later, here's the more shocking picture, um, I was full. And I was so full that I the, the thought of having another bite of anything seems so repulsive. And this is something that happens, I think, quite often. We, we get very, very hungry, we eat a lot, then we feel full. And it seems so natural that it just happens. And, and it, it's, it's um, interesting to think that there is a very complicated system that's regulating all of this in our brain. And and keeping track of exactly what we need um, to survive. So the question is, what changed in my brain before the meal and after the meal? And uh, what mechanisms do we know for what put me in these behavioral states to, uh, to want to seek food, to eat food, and then ultimately to not want to put another bite um, into my body? So this is all regulated by the brain. And um, we think of the brain as, as a solid organ um, a lot of the time. But uh, the more you learn about the brain, the more you realize that it's really a loose confederation of uh, billions of, of cells called neurons. Uh, you have about 100 billion neurons in your brain. And neurons are different from most cells in that they communicate with other cells by discharging electrical activity. So a neuron is uh, capable of firing a Brief, brief pulse of electrical activity that we call action potentials. And when neuroscientists say that a neuron is more active, what we're saying is that the frequency of action potentials and electrical discharge um, is greater than sometimes um, over, over other times. So neurons communicate with each other um, uh, through a long process. So here's sort of a textbook neuron right here. And um, the textbook neuron has what we would think of as a cell body, just like a, any other cell in the body. And the cell body has these little um, hairs that come out of it uh, called dendrites, which receive information from other cells. At, 
in the cell body, there's a decision that's made about whether to fire an action potential or an electrical discharge. And that action potential propagates down the length of a long process called an axon. And there are some neurons in your body that have very, very small axons that don't travel very far. There are some axons in your body, which are actually several feet long if they go up and down the, the spinal cord. And so depending on what that neuron does, it can communicate information over long distances. And when that electrical discharge goes down the axon, um, then it reaches the axon terminals where chemicals called neurotransmitters are released onto a secondary neuron. So this is what allows one neuron to talk to another neuron. And I think even more interesting than the fact that the human brain has 100 billion neurons is the fact that the human brain on average has about 100 trillion synaptic connections between neurons. So on average, every single neuron in your body is communicating with a thousand other neurons. And so there's this fantastic integration that's occurring in your brain. Neurons that tend to do the same function oftentimes live together. Um, so there are some functions that your brain performs where there are neurons that are scattered all around your brain. But for survival related behaviors like hunger or thirst or uh, sleep or thermoregulation, neurons tend to live together in clusters, just like uh, departments on, on Williams campus might be located on the same floor um, and, and live together. So um, what I'd like to do is go through some parts of the brain um, that regulate different aspects of, of hunger and uh, satiety. And along the way, um, as, as in addition to uh, hopefully giving you some fun facts and telling you some things about your brain you might not know, I'd also love to put you in my shoes as a neuroscientist and just show you some of the thrilling um, experiments that me and uh, my undergraduate students here, Williams, have performed. And uh, just, just to show you how I think as a scientist who studies food intake behavior. So before we get into the brain, let me just back up a step and ask, how would the brain even know if you should feel hungry or full? How does the brain um, make a decision about whether or not you should seek food or, or not seek food? And it turns out that the digestive tract is uh, very good at communicating needs to the brain. There are lots of signals that are regulated by your digestive system. Um, so if we put this uh, transparent man here for, for a moment, um, let's just talk for a minute about some signals that are coming from your digestive tract that would make you feel hungry versus some signals that are coming that would make you feel full. So first, uh, your stomach itself is, is an elastic structure. Um, it can expand to fill um, anything that you consume um, and, and put in it. And when it's relatively small, um, there are neurons that are measuring just how small your stomach is. And when you eat something, your stomach gets bigger and bigger. And when it expands, um, there are nerves that communicate to your brain the size of your stomach. Uh, it, it's a nerve called the vagus nerve. And when your stomach is relatively big, the action potential frequency of those cells um, increases and tells your brain that your stomach is getting bigger and bigger. So, so your brain uh, literally knows the size of your stomach, as, as, as people like to say. And here's an, actually a really cool picture of a, of a stomach and all of the neurons that surround the stomach. Um, the, the, the stomach is actually wrapped in a bunch of neurons that can sense the stretching of the stomach. And so this is one way that your brain knows how much you've been eating. Actually, here's a good opportunity for my first fun fact, which is that you actually have more neurons in your digestive system than you do in your spinal cord. So there are lots and lots of neurons that are lining your digestive system trying to tell your brain um, exactly what, what it's doing. Um, so in addition to uh, neural signals, there's also a lot of hormones that the digestive tract secretes. So um, uh, one potent hunger signal is called ghrelin. And when your stomach is relatively empty um, and, and relatively um, uh, small, this, there are some cells in your stomach that release ghrelin into your bloodstream. And the more ghrelin you have in your bloodstream, the more likely you are to feel hungry. Um, in fact, you can go to a, a lab mouse or a lab rat or a human being for that matter, and you can inject them with um, ghrelin and they will start feeling hungry and, and consuming food. And uh, actually one of my favorite studies that I've ever read is that if you give a human a sub-threshold dose of ghrelin, so you don't give them enough ghrelin to actually start eating, but then you ask them to do something creative, like to write a short story, they're more likely to write a short story about food if they have um, a, an injection of ghrelin, um, an administration of ghrelin in their system. 
So there's actually very few, few hormones that promote hunger. In contrast, there's a lot of hormones that promote satiety and, and feeling full. So when you have food passing uh, out of your stomach, your uh, pancreas starts to secrete a hormone called amylin. The top of your intestine, uh, the duodenum, secretes a hormone called cholecystokinin uh, or CCK. And as food goes through your intestines, the ileum of your intestine secretes a protein called uh, protein YY. And each of these hormones um, increases when there's food going through your digestive tract. And uh, if, if we were to do a blood test of you right now, um, you know, it's, it's what time is it here? My, my phone says it's 430. Um, so it's been a while since lunch. My guess is that uh, your baseline blood levels would, would show um, higher levels of ghrelin and lower levels of amylin, CCK and PYY. But as soon as you're done with dinner, um, if we were to measure your blood again, we would see that your amylin, CCK, and PYY levels increased and your ghrelin levels uh, decreased because you now have food passing through your digestive system. So this is how your brain um, knows exactly um, the nutritional state of, of your digestive tract. There's one more hormone I wanted to mention because it's so interesting. It's called leptin. And it's not secreted by your digestive tract, but it's secreted by uh, your adipose cells. The, these are these uh, white fat cells surrounding your body. And uh, the more, uh, the, the, the greater the size of the adipose cells, the more leptin is secreted into the bloodstream. And this is a hormone that acts on a really long time scale. It's not on the, on the matter of minutes or hours, um, but the, the more weight a person has gained, the more leptin they have in their system, which is based basically indicating to the brain that this person might not need as much um, calorie intake as they would normally get. And um, a fun example of, of leptin is actually there, there are mice that um, are unable to produce leptin or the leptin receptor. And so they don't feel as full as they normally would. And here's a picture of a leptin deficient mouse. Um, this is a very overweight mouse. Um, and the reason it's overweight um, is because it, it never feels full. Um, so uh, these mice are in incredibly overweight. And um, don't tell this to the chair of the animal committee, but last year my lab had one of these as a pet and they're also quite adorable. Um, but anyway, these are the the, the severe consequences of, of these hormones. And I think it's just fascinating that a single chemical circulating around your bloodstream can have such a potent effect on, on your behavior and, and the choices that you make. So these are um, some of the most well-studied ways that your digestive system communicates with your brain. And the ultimate question then is what does your brain do with this information? How does your brain decide what to do based with, with, with all of these hormones and neural signals um, from the digestive system? And I would love to study a human brain. I mean, if it, and actually, I would even volunteer for this. If there is a way to actually probe my brain in a safe way, um, I would love someone to look around and, and uh, to have my neurons stimulated. Um, maybe someday that will be possible. I know there's a lot of tech companies that are trying to, to do uh, neuromod modulation as a, as a life enhancement technique. But unfortunately, most ethics committees don't let us do things like that. And so instead of studying humans, uh, my lab studies the mouse. And uh, the mouse brain, uh, this is to scale. This is what a mouse brain looks like relative to a, to a human brain. Um, the nice thing about mouse brains is that their, um, their structures are homologous to human brains, which means even though the brain is so small, the important structures that regulate survival-related behaviors in a mouse are very consistent with the same structures in, in a human. Um, obviously, humans can do things mice can do. And actually, mice can do some things that humans can't do. But when it comes to hunger and, um, and other survival-related behaviors, the mouse acts as a really great proxy for, for a human brain. So here is a, a, a view of the human and the mouse brain from the side. And what I'd like to do is put up a sagittal diagram of a mouse brain. So this would be like if you looked at a, a mouse brain also from the side. And um, what I'll do now is I'll put up some structures that are known to regulate hunger and satiety. And over the past 10 or 20 years, a lot of um, great work done in my field have established that there are, are certain clusters of neurons that um, have a very 
potent effect on on behavior. And um, obviously, I, I don't think it would be worthwhile to, to talk about every single one of these. And so um, I'll talk about two that are really important to me and that I've personally um, studied myself a lot. And uh, the first one I'll talk about is at the very bottom of the brain. And it's a population of neurons called AGRP neurons. Um, AGRP stands for agouti related peptide. This is a unique gene um, or protein that these neurons make. No other uh, neurons in the brain make agouti related peptide. And so we call them AGRP neurons. Um, the other population that I want to talk about is uh, they're called CGRP neurons. It's a very similar sounding name. CGRP stands for calcitonin gene related peptide. But don't let the alphabet soup on this slide um, intimidate you. These, these are just names of, of cells. They're, they're, um, they're clusters of cells that scientists have given names to. Uh, my name is Matt. Your name is uh, Mod or Safa or Dukes, uh, you, whatever your name is, these are just names of neurons uh, that uh, we can identify and uh, and we can study uh, one at a time. So I would like to start by talking about EGRP neurons. Um, neuroscientists maybe should not have favorite neurons, but if, if I had to name my favorite neuron in the brain, it would be the AGRP neuron, which sits at the very bottom of the brain. And um, here's a, uh, again, a side profile of a mouse brain. Um, and the AGRP neurons are located at the very, very bottom here. So here's a three-dimensional view of a mouse brain. And through modern uh, marvels of technology, I can rotate this guy. And you can see the AGRP neurons are located um, down at the very, very bottom. Um, so AGRP neurons were discovered about 20 years ago, and one of the things that people noticed right away was that these neurons have receptors on the outside of their cell for a lot of these appetite-inducing and appetite-suppressing hormones. And so it implicated AGRP neurons right away in um, potential uh, role in, in appetite. Um, here is a coronal section of a mouse brain. So this would be if, if we looked at a single slice of a mouse brain taken at this plane. And again, the AGRP neurons are at the very, very bottom of the screen. Um, this is a technique called in situ hybridization, which is used to be able to stain for um, a particular mRNA transcript. And so in this experiment, um, um, some scientists stain for the AGRP uh, gene. And here it is in, in black at the very bottom. And so I can actually take this and I'll blow it up so we can see it in a little um, higher magnification. And um, AGRP neurons sit on either side of a hole in the brain called the third ventricle. And the third ventricle is part of the brain's ventricular system that shuttles cerebral spinal fluid throughout the brain and down the spinal cord. So I just want to say that just so you know what you're looking at. And AGRP neurons surround the third ventricle. And they're actually located in a part of the brain that has a weakened blood brain barrier so that hormones have a lot easier time uh, going into the brain so that EGRP neurons can uh, measure hormones like ghrelin and amylin and, and CCK. Here's a a more recent picture of AGRP neurons taken by a thesis student in my lab. Um, this is a maybe a little uh, more fun to look at. It's, th there's a red fluorescent protein that we put into AGRP neurons. So what you're looking at here, again, is the third ventricle in the middle. And then every blue dot is a, is a cell. Um, but the red uh, circles that you're looking at are, are AGRP neurons. And, and mice have about 10,000 um, AGRP neurons in, inside of them. So one of the first experiments done with AGRP neurons was to measure when are they active. Um, and there are multiple ways to do this. That traditionally in neuroscience, neuroscientists lower an electrode into the brain um, in a way that doesn't cause any pain uh, to, the, to the animal. Fortunately for neuroscientists, the brain has no pain receptors. And so as long as you can do something and put a local anesthetic on the skull during a surgical technique, you can lower something down into the brain. And we can record when, when AGRP neurons are most active. And um, um, there, are, there are, again, multiple ways of doing this. Um, another way of doing this, which I think is, is able better to visualize, is by measuring um, the expression of a protein called FOS or, or CFOS. And so um, here is an experiment where AGRP neurons were labeled with a red fluorescent protein. And then the brain was stained for the presence of this protein FOS. And FOS tends to be expressed in neurons that are very active. So if you take an animal, um, you put it under 
some sort of stimulus or condition, and then you stain for the presence of, of FOSS, where you see FOSS indicates neurons that were relatively very, very active at the time. So it's a proxy for neural activity. And if you're wondering, well, where's the FOSS? I don't think I see anything here. That's because this was a brain from an animal that was fed. So this, this animal is full. And what I'll show you now is the brain of an animal that was fasted, that, that's hungry. And you can see that in this animal, there's a lot of FOSS expression and the FOSS expression is localized to the AGRP neurons. And this was a, a great clue that AGRP neurons were active the more that an animal was hungry. And this is presumably because it's sensing the ghrelin and a low level of the appetite suppressing compounds. In fact, let me show you a very similar experiment. So here's a, a, a very similar experiment where an animal was injected with a saline solution. PBS stands for phosphate buffered saline. So this was used as a control. And then another group of animals were injected with ghrelin. And you can see that in response to the um, uh, appetite producing hormone ghrelin, there's phos induction in the AGRP neurons. And so scientists over the years have used multiple methods to measure activity of AGRP neurons. And the more an animal goes without food, the higher the activity level and the action potentials that are discharged in AGRP neurons. So here's where I'd like to uh, start asking you to think like a neuroscientist. So, you know, the hypothesis for many years was that AGRP neurons promote food intake. And we thought that this was a very important part of the brain that caused animals to feel hunger. And so the fun thing is to think, what would your dream experiment be to test this? If you thought that AGRP neurons, the more active they were, the more they promoted hunger, what would a neuroscientist do? to test this. And um, the, the, I, I can tell you right now, after years of being in this field, the thing that I just love to do is to stimulate AGRP neurons artificially in a mouse and then go see if it eats more food. Um, that would be a, um, that, that is fun for me. So, um, the hard part about this is that for years, um, it, it was a very difficult prospect to stimulate neurons in a living, uh, freely moving, behaving lab animal. Um, how, how would you do this? Um, so traditionally, just like electrophysiology, the way this has traditionally been done um, is to lower an electrode, only this time not to record the action potentials and measure the action potentials, but actually to inject a little bit of electricity into the AGRP neuron field. Um, and by injecting a little electricity, you can uh, zap action potentials that wouldn't normally be there, and you can stimulate um, uh, neural activity in AGRP neurons. The problem is, is that in the case of AGRP neurons, these neurons are located right next to a lot of other populations in the brain that regulate other behaviors. So for example, um, AGRP neurons happen to be located next to other neurons that promote aggression and another population of neurons that promote sexual behavior and another population of neurons that promote thirst and another population of neurons that promote stress. Full, uh, behaviors. And so um, whenever anybody tried to lower an electrode and stimulate just AGRP neurons, they almost always uh, failed. And in fact, they turned these mice into 14 year old boys because the mice were um, simultaneously um, wanting to engage in, in all sorts of behaviors and very confused as to, as to what they should do. So this technique did not work very well. But fortunately for neuroscientists, uh, a whole fleet of techniques have recently been developed that allow this to be possible. Possible. And um, it's actually now possible to stimulate very precise populations of neurons using light. And so let me uh, spend a minute to just show you how, how we do this in our lab and how the rest of my field does this as well. Is um, This actually is a great example of biology and uh, how biology, some biologists will help other biologists without even knowing it, is that um, there's a single celled algae called Chlamydomonas reynardi. And um, microbiologists characterized this algae species and they noticed that this algae evolved a protein that opened up ion channels on the membrane in response to blue light. So uh, this is a single celled animal, um, but whenever um, blue light shone on, on, the, on the surface, then um, little pores opened on the surface of, of the cell and would allow uh, ions to go back and forth like sodium and potassium. And this is important because this is how neurons work. When, when neurons fire electricity, this is what they're doing is they're allowing um, ions to go back and forth. And so what scientists did was take the gene for that protein 
and we've art artificially been able to put it into neurons. And so this, this movie is showing you now we're artificially putting this into to a neuron. And if we, if we achieve a very specific targeting and efficient targeting, we can shine blue light onto the neurons and we can turn them on whenever we want to. And it's actually possible to do this in mice and rats that are awake and freely moving and have no idea that you're, you're shining light inside their brains. So how would we do this in, an, in a real experiment? So in a real experiment, we would perform a surgery on a mouse. We would anesthetize the mouse and um, ensure that it didn't feel any pain or wasn't any, un, under any distress. And we would locate the neurons that we were interested in stimulating. So in this case, the AGRP neurons at the very, very bottom of the brain. So um, we have coordinates for where the, the AGRP neurons are. So we would go to where we know the AGRP neurons uh, were during the surgery. And we would inject a, a vector to deliver the gene that encodes this light sensitive protein. And um, I'd be happy to answer any follow up questions about what that means. But um, why don't I just summarize it as we place some molecular tricks to get the gene of this light sensitive protein into the neurons that we're interested in, just the AGRP neurons. And the, the, the cool thing is now in the year 2021, there's lots of little molecular genetic tricks to target um, what we want to very, very specific cells. So once we've targeted this uh, genetically in, uh, um, encoded protein to the AGRP neurons, we can implant a fiber optic cannula to deliver light inside the brain. And then when the mouse recovers and is feeling great and can freely move around its cage, then we, uh, meaning me and the students who work in my lab, can turn on blue light whenever we want to. And we can ask what happens when you turn on AGRP neurons um, when the animal doesn't even know that you're doing that. So. What is the effect of, of turning on EGRP neurons um, artificially? Um, and it's the, the answer is one of the coolest things I've ever seen, which is that an animal that is doing its own thing, it's just being a mouse some, somewhere in its cage, all of a sudden you press a button, you turn on a laser, and you start flashing blue light onto EGRP neurons, and the mouse will stop whatever it's doing, and it'll start eating. And here's a, a video of this. So here's a mouse, and it's got this the optic fiber in its cage. Um, I should say again, the, the mice don't feel any pain from this. Um, this is a, a very low st uh, stressful procedure for the, for the mouse, but the mice eat like crazy whenever the blue light is on. And as soon as the blue light stops, the animal will stop eating. Um, and again, I'll come back to this idea of, of free will. Um, you know, to this animal, this animal has no idea that its AGRP neurons are, are being stimulated. Um, this animal doesn't even know what AGRP neurons are. Um, you didn't know what AGRP neurons were uh, before 20, 20 minutes ago. And yet when AGRP neurons start firing, you get this inc incredible urge um, to eat. And I've never seen anything like it in mice. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing to see um, these mice just uh, voraciously consume food. Um, so here's um, the first paper that, that tried this. My colleague, Yeka Aponte, who's now a uh, PI at, at the NIH, um, did this for the first time. And um, again, they stimulated uh, AGRP neurons with blue light. And then um, they looked at a pre-period, a stimulation period, and a post-period. And what you can see here is that this animal voraciously consumes food until the light is shut off. And then as soon as the light is shut off, then the animals stop. And so this is a rapidly reversible technique. And it's amazing how just turning on a subset of neurons in the brain, a relatively few number of neurons in the brain can completely alter behavior. And I would just make the, um, the point, this is the original paper, but my lab at Williams has done this quite frequently. Um, this was a, um, a sort of a repeat of the same experiment that we did um, for, for a paper that studied something else, um, but we, we needed to use this technique and, and uh, in, in our hands too, it's just one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen uh, that stimulating these neurons increases feeding so, so dramatically. Um, by the way, when these neurons are being stimulated, mice won't engage in any other behavior, um, even behaviors that normally it would want to. So when we first started doing this, you know, we, we tried all sorts of things of um, having a male mouse and putting a female mouse in the cage. And normally male mice are not known for their chivalry. Um, they uh, do not try to court the female. They just immediately try to get to work and, and the male and the female usually just start mating right away. But then if we allow the, the mice to mate and we turn on the laser and we turn on the AGRP neurons, 
no contest. The mice always goes towards the food. And um, it's, it's an amazing thing to see the mouse thinking that it's choosing to engage in another behavior when altogether we know that this is because of a single group of neurons that we're, we're stimulating. So, so this is a, a fantastic technique. And in contrast to the stimulation of AGRP neurons, it's also possible to inhibit AGRP neurons and ask what happens if you take away the activity of AGRP neurons. And it turns out that if you decrease the amount of activity in AGRP neurons, then animals will eat less. So um, this is a figure from a paper that uh, was done in my lab where um, instead of using uh, this light activated channel technique, channel rhodopsin 2, we used a different genetically encoded tool called HM4DI. And again, don't worry about the alphabet soup involved with this. Just know that in orange here is an animal that had its AGRP neurons inhibited um, compared to a control group. And if you just do the inhibition for a little while, the animals will eat um, a little bit less than, than they normally would. But if you do something more dramatic, if you um, use other genetic tools to just ablate AGRP neurons altogether, for example, you can express a toxin just in AGRP neurons and remove AGRP neurons from, from a, um, a living mouse, then animals won't eat at all. So here's an example of an experiment done by the lab I did my uh, postdoctoral fellowship in, where if you ablate AGRP neurons, you see what happens to body weight over the, the next successive days as food intake goes way down, body weight goes in, way down, and it shows you just how important AGRP neurons are to this feeling of hunger and this, this desire to eat um, when, when necessary. So um, how do they do it? If uh, you know AGRP neurons increase their activity and they drive food consumption in in mice, uh, the obvious next question is is how? How does action potentials in AGRP neurons cause a mouse to to change its behavior? And there's really only one way a neuron can cause an effect like that, and that's by talking to other neurons. And so AGRP neurons they send their axons throughout the brain, and it's really interesting to follow those axonal projections and ask where do they go and what are the down downstream regions do. So these are the projections of AGRP neurons in the brain. Um, there, there are different places downstream where, where they project. And um, I, I, I like thinking of AGRP neurons as sort of uh, conductors of an orchestra. When AGRP neurons are firing, then they influence all the other musicians. And all of these other downstream brain regions are the, are the woodwinds or the brass or the percussion. And when you put it all together, we call that hunger. But what's cool is by looking at each projection one at a time, we can actually dissect the contributions of each one uh, to hunger. And so using this light stimulation tool, it's it's actually possible to stimulate each downstream projection one at a time. So instead of shining blue light on the AG, AGRP neurons themselves, we can shine blue light on the downstream projection. So for example, just shine blue light on the BNST or the paraventricular thalamus or the paraaqueductal gray or the parabrachial nucleus or the uh, nucleus tractus solitarius. Um, and we can ask what are the contributions of each individual region. And when scientists do this, we actually find that only a handful of these downstream regions that I've highlighted and circled in red here are capable of recapitulating something that we would say looks like hunger. These are the only downstream braid regions where if you stimulate stimulate them, then the animal will still go and, and consume food. And a modern task of people in my field right now is to ask, what is it about these downstream brain regions that are producing a feeling of hunger and the empty stomach feeling and the desire to uh, relieve yourself of that discomfort of hunger by, by consuming food? And so that is a task that people are, are now actively working on. But it also begs the question, what are the other projections doing? So the, the downstream projections that are not circled in red, if AGRP neuron projections to those downstream areas isn't causing hunger, then what is the function of those downstream projections? And the answer is actually really fascinating. Um, and this is one of my favorite things about being a neuroscientist is sometimes when you uh, find the answers to these experiments, you learn something about yourself that you never really knew. So for example, one of these projections that I'm showing you here on the screen is a, is a projection from AGRP neurons to another part of the brain called the central nucleus of the amygdala. And any student who's taken an introduction to uh, neuroscience 
class knows that the amygdala is a structure that uh, really potently regulates emotions and in rodents, especially anxiety and fear related emotions. Usually when people hear the word amygdala, they think fear. So why would AGRP neurons be projecting to a part of the brain that regulates fear? And this is one of the interesting things about AGRP neurons as well, is it actually turns out that AGRP neurons, the neurotransmitter they release downstream is not excitatory, it's actually inhibitory, which means that when AGRP neurons release neurotransmitter downstream, they actually inhibit the downstream part, uh, the, the, the downstream neurons that, that they talk to. So in this case, AGRP neurons are inhibiting the part of the brain that makes animals feel anxious. Um, and there have been numerous studies that have shown that when you stimulate AGRP neurons or just the projections to the, the amygdala neurons, that animals show decreased anxiety and decreased fear. And actually, hungry humans also show decreased anxiety and decreased fear. This is one of these things you might not know about yourself. Um, there have been a good number of psychology experiments where um, human participants are asked to play a game in which they need to take a risk. So for example, a gambling game where you, you need to take a risk. And it turns out that humans who are more hungry are more willing to take a risk. And not only do the humans not know that, um, in, in, they're, they're told what the experiment is after it's over, but th they don't know that they're taking more of a risk, but their, their brain is allowing them to do this. But not only do they not know that, they probably don't know that the reason why they're taking more of a risk is because of millions of years of evolution that have been designed to encourage risk taking if you're in a, in a hungry state. So the reason, presumably, that AGRP neurons inhibit anxiety is presumably because our our ancestors um, in uh, the African plains, uh, you know, who were scared of predators and there was nothing uh, too special about humans uh, back then, um, needed to take risks the more hungry they got. And um, the, the brain has encouraged animals to take more risks to go seek out food, even though there's a danger of predators, um, the more an animal needs nutrition. And so um, this uh, study that discovered that is was from my colleague, Stephanie Padilla, who's now a professor at uh, University of um, uh, UMass Amherst. Um, she, she sat right next to me for a couple of years. And um, th this paper joins a suite of other papers that I thought I would just read some paper titles for you. So I just copied and pasted the, the titles and the authors of the paper. So um, another paper that my friend Stephanie worked on was something about how AGRP neurons project to areas of the brain that regulate fertility. And so the more active an AGRP neuron is and the more hungry you, fall, you feel, um, the more the parts of your brain that um, are encouraging fertility are inhibited. So why would this be? This is uh, presumably because if you are uh, an animal and you have very low nutrient levels, then you should do whatever it takes to conserve your nutrients and you shouldn't engage those en energy resources uh, toward, towards mating and uh, spermatogenesis and ovulation and, and anything else that requires requires energy. Um, the survival of you at that moment is more important than the survival of your species. And so um, presumably this is the, the um, evolutionary reason for this projection from AGRP neurons to um, a, a great name of neuron population, KISS-1. Um, it's also been shown that AGRP neurons inhibit pain. So uh, the more hungry an animal is, the more AGRP neurons inhibit downstream structures that cause pain. And again, presumably, this is because if you're in pain because you've been wounded, but you haven't eaten in a long time, then this allows an animal to go uh, have the resources necessary to go get food. Um, and AGRP neurons actually also inhibit itch, which is kind of interesting as well. So um, my lab contributed to this uh, somewhat um, here at Williams. I, I worked with a, a good number of um, uh, thesis students. And one thing uh, that was obvious to us is that it's impossible for an animal to eat and to sleep at the same time. Um, so the more hungry an animal is, um, the less likely it is to, to sleep. And so um, what uh, some thesis students in my lab did, um, especially Nitsan, Goldstein, Brian Levine, Kelsey Loy, William Duke, Olivia 
Meyerson and Adam Jamnick, is um, we first just food deprived some animals. And when we food deprived animals, we realized that there is a decrease in sleep. Um, they don't engage in non rapid eye mo movement sleep as much as they normally would, and they spend a more time awake. And not only that, but when animals do go to sleep, their sleep is fragmented. So when we looked at the um, electroencephalogram nature of sleep, we found that the non REM sleep had these, these pauses and these uh, fragmentations in it, and that the number of fragmentations went up in a, in a food deprived mouse compared to a sleep deprived mouse. So what we tried doing was inhibiting AGRP neurons to see if this effect was mediated by AGRP neurons. And it turns out that when you food deprive a mouse and then measure sleep, in mice that have their AGRP neurons inhibited, um, non-REM sleep is, is restored in those animals. And so what this shows you is that it's it's AGRP neurons that are measuring the need for food and interfering with your ability to fall asleep um, in order to promote, to promote food intake behavior. It also rescues the fragmentation in, in sleep quality. If we stimulate AGRP neurons, that uh, dramatically um, also causes a reduction in non-REM sleep. So not only are AGRP neurons necessary for promoting hunger over sleep, but they're also sufficient to do it. And so this will promote food intake and food seeking behavior at the expense of non-REM sleep as well. So um, this has been uh, fun to work on. Here, here are two of those students presenting uh, this study at a, at a conference, and, and this was a, a fun paper uh, to work on. There are uh, some students in my lab right now, Farah Skulamali and Sarah Woolworth, who are actually measuring the opposite. They're trying to figure out if an animal is very sleep deprived, does that inhibit AGRP neurons? Because in that instance, it's better to fall asleep than it is to, to seek food. So I will end talking about AGRP neurons now um, with a, a quotation, this time from Virginia Woolf. Um, and I think this puts it nicely. Uh, one cannot think well, love well, sleep well, if one has not dined well. And I might add, because AGRP neurons inhibit downstream neural populations to prioritize feeding, because that is now what we know about how hunger affects the rest of the brain. So at this point, I'd like to shift from talking about EGRP neurons to talking about neurons that promote a sense of being full. And these neurons are in the back of the brain. They're called calcitonin gene-related peptide neurons. And um, here's another uh, diagram of where they are. They're in the very, very back of the brain. And if uh, you know, I rotate this guy, uh, what you can see is that they're, they're located in a part of the brain called the parabrachial area, the parabrachial nucleus. But only these cells in yellow express this protein called CGRP. And I worked on these neurons extensively when I was a postdoctoral fellow. We discovered that these CGRP neurons are necessary and sufficient for appetite suppression, and that they are most active when um, the stomach is inflated and when there's a high potency of appetite suppressing hormones in the brain. So here's a picture of them. These are, uh, they're like old friends to me. And um, what I'm going to do now is, is uh, superimpose on these red CGRP neurons another FOS stain. So FOS is the protein that uh, tends to be present in neurons that are very, very active. And what we did was we uh, put a red fluorescent protein into CGRP neurons, and then we gave animals a large meal so they felt really full, and we stained for this FOS protein protein in green to figure out which cells are active when the animal has had a big meal. And look at that. It's the CGRP neurons. The CGRP neurons um, are, are very specifically activated in response to a large meal. Um, and they're also activated by, by appetite suppressing hormones. So we did a very similar experiment. We put um, this light sensitive protein into CGRP neurons and we let the animals eat food. So what you're looking at here is a mouse that's getting um, liquid food. This is actually vanilla um, Ensure, like you would get from a drugstore, like a little vanilla milkshake and the animal is enjoying its milkshake but um, we use this light technique to stimulate CGRP neurons and whenever we did this we noticed that it, sometimes it would take a few seconds but the mice would um, within five or ten seconds lose complete interest in eating and um, would ignore the food spout and would go to one side of its cage and ignore um, uh, feeding for the rest of its um, uh, until we shut the light off essentially so 
here's what this experiment looks like in, in quantitative form. So in red is a control animal that's not having its CGRP neuron stimulated. And in progressively darker shades of gray is higher and higher levels of stimulation of CGRP neurons. And I hope what you can see is that the more you stimulate CGRP neurons, um, the more animals don't eat, uh, presumably because uh, they're, they're feeling full um, at the time. Um, if we did this for a longer period of time, here we're inhibiting, uh, or sorry, we're stimulating CGRP neurons for four days. If we stimulated uh, these neurons continuously for four days um, using this uh, drug called CNO, which uh, we designed uh, specifically to activate those neurons, what we found is that this completely suppressed feeding um, and it, as soon as we stopped doing the experiment, they would regain their body weight, they would regain interest in food, but whenever CGRP neurons were active, they lost all interest in food. We also did the opposite. We inhibited CGRP neurons. And when animals lose the activity in their CGRP neurons, they actually eat a lot more when they shouldn't be eating. So for example, if we inject animals with um, a compound called lithium chloride, which normally gives animals a little bit of a stomach ache, or we give animals a, a compound called lipopolysaccharide, which mimics food poisoning, or we give them the, the appetite suppressing hormones that I talked about earlier, amylin and CCK, if we inhibit CGRP neurons, then they'll eat more than they normally would eat, which shows that CGRP neurons in, in the parabrachial area play an essential role in uh, regulating appetite suppression in response to those, to those compounds. So the paper, the, I guess my big claim to fame when I was a postdoc was called Genetic Identification of a Neural Circuit that Suppresses Appetite. And it we, we talked all about the CGRP neurons. But there are many papers that have followed suit. So for example, um, uh, a colleague of mine, Carlos Campos, uh, described paragrachial CGRP neurons as controlling meal termination. So every time an animal eats a meal, it's the CGRP neurons that tell you to stop eating the meal. Um, one of my favorite papers actually identified CGRP neurons as being um, the neurons that are overactive when someone has a very serious disease like cancer. So um, when, when someone um, has a, a very debilitating illness like cancer, one of the big signs is losing your appetite. And um, it's been shown that in some models of cancer, the reason why animals will lose their appetite is because they have overactive CGRP neurons. And if you uh, inhibit the CGRP neurons, then the animals will eat more than they, they normally would. And then finally, a uh, paper, parabrachial CGRP neurons um, establish and sustain aversive taste memories. So this paper has shown that uh, CGRP neurons are necessary for the formation of, of a phenomenon called conditioned taste aversion. And con conditioned taste aversion is a phenomenon where if you eat something and you feel sick, then you tend never to want to eat that food again. So for example, I ate too many Cheetos at a birthday party when I was nine. And to this day, I don't like eating Cheetos. So that was likely a result of my, my CGRP neurons. Um, so AGRP neurons and CGRP neurons really sort of look, are, they're like a balance beam. When AGRP neurons are active, you really want to eat, just like I eat that large dinner. And then over the course of a meal, the AGRP activity decreases and the CGRP activity goes up and you, uh, you feel full and, 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 and an animal feels full. So one of the first things I did when I came to, to Williams College was actually to look at both of these neurons in, in combination. And one of the things we noticed was that AGRP neurons actually send axons to the CGRP neurons and inhibit them. And so what this means is that when AGRP neurons are active, they're actively trying to inhibit the CGRP neurons. And so a couple of really great thesis students who worked with me a few years ago, Rachel Esner and Allison Smith, actually did some great experiments to show that AGRP neurons actively try to overcome the appetite suppressing effects of, of CGRP neurons. And so the way they did this was to put the light stimulating um, uh, protein that activates neurons into AGRP neurons and then stimulating the downstream projections in the CGRP neurons. And uh, what they found uh, one of the first things they found was that when they activated CGRP neurons uh, using amylin or CCK or these other compounds that usually reduce um, appetite, they found that when they stimulated AGRP neurons, this reduced the amount of activity in uh, CGRP neurons. And not only did it reduce the activity of CGRP neurons, but it increased food 
intake during uh, conditions that normally an animal uh, wouldn't eat. Um, so normally in response to amylin and CCK and the, these appetite suppressing compounds, um, animals don't eat very much. But if you stimulate the AGRP projections onto the appetite suppressing area, that relieved a little bit of the appetite suppression and that allowed the animals to eat a little bit more. Um, and this was actually my first paper from my lab um, at Williams College. And um, um, what I take this to mean is that AGRP neurons are, are sort of like um, when you press the gas pedal on your car. Uh, AGRP neurons are trying to get you to eat. And that's like pressing the gas pedal on your car, trying to get you to go. But you can't drive your car if the parking brake is on. And so the purpose of AGRP neurons inhibiting CGRP neurons is essentially to try to take off the parking brake so that you can eat in conditions in, uh, if you haven't had food in a while, so you can make sure that you're getting proper uh, nutrition and uh, discourage appetite suppression from the CGRP neurons. So there's one more thing I want to uh, share with you today, and, and then we'll be done. And this is something my lab has worked on for the past few years that has been very exciting to me. Um, a few years ago, my lab uh, performed a, an experiment uh, to look at inputs to CGRP neurons. Um, so let me just uh, tell you this from the thrill of a, of a scientific story, um, and, and then we'll be done is um, a, a few years ago, a, a student in my lab named uh, Teresa Legan um, used a, a, a combination of molecular tricks to try to label all of the neurons that project axons to CGRP neurons. So we really wanted to know what other parts of the brain send their axons to CGRP neurons, because we were thinking if CGRP neurons suppress appetite, then it'd be really cool to know uh, like other parts of the brain that might want to suppress appetite by, by projecting there. Like for example, maybe if, if an animal smells something really bad, that will suppress appetite because of the rancid, uh, awful smell. Um, so we used this, this uh, molecular trick, uh, a series of, of uh, vectors, and uh, it seems like magic, but by using these, these new molecular tools, we were able to label all of the areas that projected to CGRP neurons and label them in a fluorescent green color. And um, Teresa Legan did a beautiful job. And one of the things that was a surprise to us is that actually there weren't very many brain regions that projected to CGRP neurons. It seems the CGRP neurons are mostly getting signals from the stomach and appetite suppressing hormones. However, we did find this, this population of neurons that we didn't know much about previously. And in fact, when I saw them under the microscope for the first time, I had no idea what they, what they were. Um, so they were located very close by the AGRP neurons, but in a, in a slightly different place. And um, what we did was we used a, a, a tool called a mouse brain atlas. This is like a, an atlas of the earth, except it's, a, it's an atlas of mouse brain parts. Um, this is the kind of thing that, that people in my field read. Um, so this is a typical image from a, a brain atlas. And what we noticed was that we were seeing the green fluorescent cells right about here um, in a place called the parasubthalamic nucleus. And I had never heard of this brain structure before. Um, so, I, so we looked it up and we identified exactly where it is. And I started looking for it on a, a, a website called PubMed. And PubMed is sort of like um, a Google site to find uh, papers in biology related fields. And it turns out that if you enter search terms into PubMed, like feeding, you'll get thousands and thousands of papers. So you type in parabrachial, you'll get almost 3,000. AGRP gives you 1,600. But if you type in parasubthalamic nucleus, there was very, very few papers. And actually, there were only about three papers that actually focused on the parasubthalamic nucleus. So this was a very um, uh, unknown brain structure. But we knew that it sent projections to an appetite suppressing center. And so um, we started looking at this. And, and a student in my lab named Jacob Sperber did this initial experiment where we gave mice a really big meal and then we stained for FOSS. This is the protein that tends to be expressed in, in very active neurons. And what we found was that in a food deprived animal, there wasn't very much FOSS expression where the, age, where the um, PSTN was. But following a meal, there was lots of expression in the PSTN. And this was our first insight that this might be a brain area worth studying. So what we wanted to do was find a genetic marker 
for these neurons. So just like AGRP neurons are called AGRP neurons because they make AGRP and the same with CGRP neurons. We wanted a gene or a protein that we could use to characterize these neurons and identify them and give them a name. And a student last year in the lab named, named uh, Lauren Hoyer um, actually meticulously looked at different genes that we, we thought would be expressed in the area. And she discovered that there were two that marked this area very well. There was one called tachykinin-1 and another called uh, corticotropin releasing hormone, CRH. And the interesting thing was that these are completely different groups of neurons. There's one group that makes TAC and there's another one that makes CRH and they don't overlap at all. And we actually confirmed that with this fancy, whoops, this fancy microscope technique uh, called a confocal microscope and made 3D images. And we saw that these cells were completely uh, distinct from, from one another. So uh, we wanted to study this and figured out what makes them active. So we looked at FOSS expression following a large meal. And what we found is in, in a food deprived mouse, there was hardly any FOSS expression, but in an animal that had a large meal, there was a lot of FOSS expression in both the TAC neurons and the CRH neurons. We also tried injecting appetite suppressing compounds. And we found that in response to an injection of saline, again, there was no FOSS, but in response to an injection of amylin, CCK or PYY, which I talked about previously, there was not only an increase in FOSS expression, but this FOSS overlapped with tachykinin-1 and with CRH. Then another student in my lab, uh, Jessica Kim, used another technique to look at activity in the TAC1 neurons. This is actually a, a new technique my lab just set up to visualize neural activity. It's kind of the opposite of the light stimulation technique. What this is, is it uses a form of green fluorescent protein that glows more, the more active that a neuron is. And so we were able to look at neurons in real time and see what these TAC1 neurons in the PSTN respond to. And lo and behold, Old, these neurons, when we when we looked at the um, activity in a awake behaving mouse, we found that these uh, the activity of these neurons increased in response to food in in a food deprived animal. Um, they also responded to um, a, a palatable food, peanut butter, but not at all to a novel object and also not to water in a water deprived animal. So it seems that these PSTN neurons are activated by the presence of food and about consuming food. They're also activated in response to the appetite suppressing hormones like amylin, CCK, and PYY. So this change in fluorescence that we're seeing is showing you the activation of these neurons in real time as the mouse is moving about its cage. So a student last year named Matt Newman decided to try inhibiting these TAC1 neurons and seeing if they responded to uh, hormones as they normally do. And it turns out that when TAC1 PSTN neurons are inhibited, that animals will actually eat more following injection of amylin, CCK, or PYY. So in magenta here is showing you the animals that are having its TAC1 PSTN neurons inhibited, and in black are control animals. And so what this is showing you is that that this parasubthalamic structure is necessary for the full effects of appetite suppressing compounds. The interesting thing is when Matt tried this in uh, CRH neurons, we didn't see very much of an effect. So this is specific to the TAC1 population. So then finally, we've tried stimulating these neurons. And these experiments were done by students named uh, Grace Crom, Olivia Barnhill, Sierra Loomis, and uh, Jacob Sperber. And we tried using this light stimulation technique to stimulate TAC1 neurons and CRH neurons. And what we found is that by stimulating TAC1 neurons, we were able to decrease appetite, but not CRH neurons. And when we tried this with another method, uh, not the light stimulation method, but by a, a chemical method, we found that appetite actually went way down over a long period in TAC1 neuron stimulated animals, but not CRH related, um, uh, CRH expressing PSTN neurons. So um, the last thing I'll show you is that uh, uh, Grace Crom and uh, Sierra Loomis meticulously mapped the downstream projections from this PSTN structure and found that some of the downstream structures they both projected to, but some only the TAC1 neurons projected to, and some only the CRH neurons projected to. And this is probably why stimulation of TAC1 neurons or inhibition of TAC1 neurons affected appetite, but the CRH neurons did not. Um, and in fact, Grace Crom has already taken the step of stimulating the projections to the, the CGRP neurons in the parabrachial neuro, uh, nucleus and finding that that uh, suppresses appetite as well.
So there's plenty to do uh, with the PSTN. We're just about ready to submit our first manuscript, and it's exciting to have presented this a little bit. My lab last year was supposed to present this at a conference last summer, but of course, because of COVID-19, we couldn't do that. So instead, I'll show you this picture of us all going apple picking in better days. Um, but we're excited to get this paper out um, soon. So I will wrap up and just say um, there are several brain regions which control hunger and fullness. And I'm hoping now that my lab is able to put this new brain region, the parasubthalamic nucleus on the map. But I personally uh, feel exhilarated when I look at one of these circuit diagrams. There really is a food network in the brain that's trying to measure everything that an animal is eating and trying to get the animal to shape its behavior in ways that uh, we as, as the animals don't even know. And I think there's a lot of great work ahead to find find out what our brains are doing and how we're hardwired to ex execute these behaviors. And um, it's been very fun for me to be in this field and to be uh, participating in this field here at Williams College with all the great people that we have here. So I'd, I'll stop here and I'll acknowledge all the uh, fantastic people who I've had the, the pleasure of working with, all sorts of amazing students who are now out in the world doing amazing things, except for my students this year who uh, have a few months left to go. Um, I could do an Academy Award style uh, thank you speech uh, to thank uh, so many faculty here, but I'll only thank the faculty who have tangibly uh, uh, added to my research scholarship. And so Dr. Jeremy Cohn, Charlie Durrett, um, Kate Jensen have, has helped a lot with uh, the fiber photometry technique in my lab of measuring neural activity. And uh, Noah Sandstrom and Steve Swope, who also have animals in the animal facility, have uh, helped me greatly with the animals uh, that I have down there. And I acknowledge my uh, research support for, with grants from the NIH and the NSF. And um, I am thankful for you for being here. And I would be very, very happy to answer any questions that you have. So thank you very much for adding to your Zoom schedule. And I'll assume that you are now all giving me raucous applause. Thank you very much. So I'll turn things back over to Stephanie. Okay, thank, thanks so much, Matt. That was just great. And I think um, maybe from the, the perspective of many lay people in the audience uh, who have perhaps wondered if everything is still functioning properly up there over this past year, I think that um, right. it's, just, it's just been wonderful to kind of have this reminder of um, our exquisite brains. So thank you very much. Uh, there are some questions that are, that are coalescing kind of around a couple of topics. And People are wondering about um, whether different kinds of foods make any sort of difference here. Foods that are um, kind of more caloric, more filling, volume, does the food matter in this whole picture? Yeah, that's a great question. And it and it does matter. And there are different brain regions, which I didn't talk about, which actually responds to different um, caloric substances. And so um, it actually turns out that the um, taste receptors that you have on your tongue that identify tastes as being sweet or savory or salty, you have a copy of those taste receptors in your intestinal tract. And so you actually taste at two spots in your body. You, you taste in your mouth, which you're conscious to, and that's kind of gross to think about but your gut also tastes the food that you're eating. And um, it sends signals to your brain about the specific nutrients that you're eating. And there are some nutrients that actually um, promote satiety more than others. And so fats um, uh, suppress appetite more than carbohydrates do. Um, and proteins are, are, are somewhere in the middle. Actually, sugars can actually, in, in, in some cases, uh, stimulate further appetite. So if you were gonna have the, the munchies for something, it's actually probably better from a, a caloric uh, point of view and trying to, to keep calories low to have something that's a little on the fattier side or, or the savory side, protein side, because um, carbohydrates, they don't promote satiety as much as fats and uh, proteins do. Okay, great. Thank you. And then um, other questions about, uh, you know, people are obviously curious about the human, more of the human, potential human applications of this. And mm -hmm. um, you know, whether, you know, where you see your research leading potentially um, toward the treatment of eating disorders, for example, or these sorts of things, if you could. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a fantastic question. And there's a lot of, um, uh, research going into this, not just from basic uh, research labs like like mine and other scientists in the field, but there's obviously um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry um, spends billions of dollars trying to learn how to how to target these things. And um, and actually, it's interesting. I, I 
as a scientist, I go and give talks at conferences and I'll go be invited to give a talk at other colleges and universities. But it's interesting, a lot of uh, biotech and pharmaceutical companies invite scientists like me to go um, visit them as well because they wanna learn about these parts of the brain and they wanna know how to target them better. And so um, it's, I would say there's a huge amount of activity trying to figure out how to target AGRP neurons um, and CGRP neurons, um, both to um, suppress appetite as, a, as an obesity fighting drug, but also to to stimulate appetite in um, people who are suffering from these illnesses, um, not, not only um, uh, debilitating illnesses um, suppress appetite, but a lot of times the, the drugs that are prescribed for people um, and the pain medications actually suppress appetite as well. So there's a lot of people trying to um, figure out medications for this. So far, there hasn't been um, a drug that's developed that seems to be specific for these specific populations of neurons. I think that's the trick. If someone could figure out a pharmaceutical compound that could selectively stimulate just the CGRP neurons, then that would be a wonderful thing. At first, people tried targeting the hormones themselves. So when leptin was first discovered, for example, um, people thought they had discovered the miracle cure because if, if leptin suppresses appetite, then why don't we just go around injecting ourselves with leptin all day? Um, the reason is actually the brain is remarkable about adapting to um, exogenous application of these, these compounds. And so if, if, um, if I were to inject myself with leptin right now, I would probably have a decreased appetite today and tomorrow. But over the, the coming days, my appetite would come right back. And so there's a lot of um, uh, emphasis in trying to figure this out. But so far, the pharmaceutical side hasn't uh, been so great. I would just say, though, that I think under undercovering the basic wiring diagram of the brain, what I'm calling the food network, um, is a great first step. Um, and it seems like that's uh, maybe not the, the most important thing to do in terms of getting a drug or a a therapeutic agent, but even just knowing how hunger works in the first place will give us the roadmap to developing these things in the future. So I really hope that we do discover something in the future. Okay, great, thanks. I think we maybe just have time for, for another one and there's lots of good questions. Maybe you can find Matt on campus and, and ask him your questions. But this-, sure. this I question should say I put my email down below too on the slide and I'd, I'd be very, very happy to answer any questions over email or, um, or from six feet away. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So one more. This sounds like this is a funny question, but I think it's a serious question. And this is, what does the science of being hangry look like? That, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I, lo I love that question because I would really like to pursue that in my lab. I've actually discussed this with uh, thesis students in, in previous years, and we are developing an experimental protocol to do this. Um, but I would love to develop this. It, and, and I think being hangry is real. So um, I, I'm assuming that the, the questioner is defining being hangry as um, when whenever you're more and more hungry, you tend to be more irritable and more um, aggressive in, in nature. And I I have noticed this in the animals that we've stimulated. When I when I stimulate um, EGRP neurons in in a mouse, usually the, we keep the mice isolated because we don't want the mice to interfere with the experiment. But I've noticed that whenever we've happened to do this, where another mouse is in the cage, I've noticed that the other mouse does get sort of aggressive, or, or I'm sorry, the, the animal that's being stimulated. So I would love to formalize this in, a, in an experiment. And I, I we've come up with all sorts of cool paper titles of a, a mouse model of hanger. Um, I'd love to write a grant on this. <laughs> see what see if they respond to the word hanger but i actually think this is a really great thing to study and and especially identifying the the downstream parts of the brain that mediate the emotional aspects of it um this is something i'm, I'm smiling so much because i would love to do this and i think in future years um people who hear uh, projects from my lab will uh, will hear the word hanger quite a bit 